So I discovered this morning another reason for this door. It's so you don't have to hear my singing. You don't have to hear me singing off key, which is right. Yeah, give, give, it, give it a hand for that. Yeah, that's right. So I'm gonna, I want you to play a little game with me, a little word association game this morning. Are you ready for that? Are you, are you awake yet? You know, you're like, I haven't had enough coffee. All right, it's going to be okay. Trust me, all right? So I'm going to give you some words, and I want you to tell me what you associate those words with, all right? And the first set of words is going to be hard. I'm going to tell you, I made it hard for the first, and then it gets a little easier. So you ready for this? All right, everybody are listening? Okay, good. So here are the first few words. I'm going to give you four words. Listen to them. What, does it, what comes to mind? What do you associate these with? Plow, camel, tree, child. Who said yoga? Very good. Yes, a student, favorite. That's yoga. Those are all yoga poses. If you didn't hear me, all right, now I'll give you the easy set. Maybe it'll make sense to the rest of you, so stay. All right, listen to this. Cow, cobra, warrior, downward dog. Now what are you thinking of? Yoga, right? It's become very popular here in the United States to to practice yoga. You want to see my favorite yoga pose? Yes. All right, this is my favorite yoga pose right here. <laughs> I do this every night for eight hours. It works great. It's a great stress reliever, all right? So <clears throat> that is the yoga pose. That is actu- an actual yoga pose, by the way. Um, I forget the name of it. It's a, it's a name I can't. What is it? Uh, I can't even, still can't say it, but that's it. You're right. So, so that's it. So one of the things become very popular, Eastern religion has become very popular in the U.S., and one of the ways we see that is in the practice of yoga, even though yoga in the gym has become kind of devoid sometimes of its spiritual practice, the exercise and the, and the stress relief and the, and the things that the benefit, health benefits come along with it, we've been practicing here in the U.S., and it's become very popular in these days. Now, this, this particular form of yoga that we practice here in the gym comes out of a Eastern religion that has been uh, called Hinduism. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about Hinduism and another Eastern religion that came out of the same context of Hinduism, uh, uh, which is Buddhism. And so I actually asked for some help this this week uh, to help explain this. So I thought uh, I asked the help of a member of our church. Her name's Paranika Paranika Natarajan. And she grew up in India. Um, she grew up in, in a Hindu family, and she practiced the Hindu faith. And, um, and so I asked her some questions about Hinduism, and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, how many gods they have in Hinduism, and she's going to talk a little bit about karmic debt and the idea of karmic debt. So I'd ask you just to listen very carefully uh, to some of what she had to say about, Hindu, her, uh, about growing up as a Hindu. As far as the Hindu faith itself goes, um, there's the faith that there's one God, one Supreme God, and all these other gods are the manifestations of the Supreme God. But if you actually go to a Hindu temple, you'll see different uh, you know, places where they worship different gods. There is also some concept of Trinity, um, like there's a creator God, and there's a protector God, and there's a destructor God. And uh, the, there are, uh, there's one specific God, the protector God, goes through different avatars, you know, a word that has, you know, become familiar to us all now with video games and whatnot. Yeah. So, um, the God goes through different avatars basically to get rid of the evil in the world and uh, save the good people. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of faith. And then there is also the concept of, uh, some of you may have heard about Hinduism has like uh, 330 million gods. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, the wives of those three gods, and they are God themselves, and then uh, the sons and daughters of those gods, they are gods themselves. And then um, the 330 million gods, it's like sub-gods or deities, you know. So that's the concept. But most people kind of have this idea that uh, Hinduism has a lot of gods. So. The belief is that they are manifestations of the gods. So when you pray to one of those gods, you know, you pray to the ultimate god. And the other thing is, um, just like I was talking about creator God, you know, um, protector God, like that, you know, when you have, um, when you want certain things from a God, certain gods can give certain things, like, you know, education, 
you can go to if you, one god and if you want to be strong and mighty you go to another god and pray but and then there could be favorites like some of or some people may have a family god or a, you know a uh, favorite god that they go to and pray to okay. uh, either you get to heaven or you get reborn so that's where the concept of karma or the uh, good and bad that you do comes into play so um, there is something called a karmic debt so which is like um, you know the you go through the cycles of life and uh, you know birth life and death until uh, you do enough good things to compensate for your the bad things that you did in your life so you know if i die today you know and i'm a hindu there is no really i cannot be sure of where i will end up if i'll come back to the earth or you know if i'm going to make it to heaven um the way it goes is if you do enough good things it will sort of compensate for your bad things it's like yeah. a, you know your bank debt you know mm-hmm. you kind of keep on paying and then you know once the good becomes more than the bad things that you did then you are ready to uh, you know be admitted into heaven but there is always that question how would anyone know how good you are or uh, if you have you know the bad things that you did really have compensated and you know, your debt has been paid or not they don't have any problems accepting jesus as another god right. and also like a good teacher right. you know, so um, like i said because there are many gods in the mm-hmm. um, hindu religion um, having jesus as another god is not at all a um, problem okay so i don't know if you could catch everything but she's really talking about the various gods and how jesus becomes another god and there's like the supreme being and then there's all these 330 million gods, and then sub-gods under those gods, and sons and daughters of those gods. So there are all these layers of gods within the Hindu religion. And the, she also talked about karmic debt, that you and I, uh, that in Hindu faith, that you and I, human beings, incur karmic debt as we live our lives. And as we do things, negative things, bad things, we increase our karmic debt. And then as we do good things, we comp- you know we pay off that karmic debt and we get and you go through a process of life after life after life of reincarnation as you try and get through all that karmic debt that you've uh, you are a human being have built up and so they propose four what they call yogas it's not just one yoga we think a yoga as you know you know downward dog or warrior pose or whatever but there are actually four yoga paths that they teach and here are the four the first one is janana yoga and that's the way to God through wisdom and knowledge so that you can overcome karmic debt and find out more about God as you learn about God and understand spiritual things. Number two is bhakti yoga, and that's the way to God through devotion to God. That's where you would worship God and adore God and love God. The more you love God, the more you can overcome that karmic debt. Then there's number three, karma yoga. Karma yoga is the way to God through right action. And so by doing good deeds, helping other people, serving the world, Those are ways to do that. And then the fourth one is Raja Yoga, and that's the way to God through psychological exercises. And that's really the 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 area the area of yoga that the practice of yoga we see in the gym comes from. It's the exercise and it's a spiritual exercise as well, or a meditative exercise. It's a way to actually use it for stress relief and meditation, which is very helpful as we know. And so those are the four ways they uh, try four different ways to do that to overcome karmic debt. I would mention this, that in Christianity, all four of those ways are also suggested. Uh, I don't know if you could see that, but I can see, you know, we're, we're taught to learn about God, study the Bible, learn more about who God is and understand our relationship to God. We're taught to love God, seek first the kingdom of God. We're taught to serve and to do right things and serve other people and do the right actions. And we're also uh, do things that develop us spiritually and grow us spiritually as disciples. And so there are a lot of similar, si- there are some similarities there. So that's Hinduism. Now out of Hinduism, not out of Hinduism, but out of the same cultural context, I would say Buddhism emerged as well. And Hinduism is one of the oldest uh, world religions of all the five religions. And then out of that became Bud- Buddhism emerged from a particular person. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he was born in 563 BC, 
and he lived in a wealthy family in a very rich mansion. He was kind of segregated from the rest of the world, and he decided at age 29 to leave his family and go explore the world around him, and when he went and explored the world around him, he saw a lot of suffering, especially as he encountered poverty for the first time, or he encountered people not, not needing to be healed or cured, and so he began to see all this suffering in the world that he had never been exposed to before. So he began to think, how, how are we going to resolve suffering? And so he began to think, uh, you know, will wealth and materialism help us? And he decided that wealth and materialism was not the answer to suffering, that you still suffered even no matter how much money you made, no matter how much uh, stuff you had. And then he started to go through the, he began to practice more Hinduism and religious practice and spiritual practice. And he began that through that, he said through religion actually is not a way to overcome suffering. So he proposed what he called his middle way and really was a way of spiritual practice that doesn't even believe in God. There's no God in Buddhism. There is a, it's about practice and teaching that leads a person to a state of existence that he called or was called enlightenment. And so he actually sat and went into a meditative trance. I think it was for about 40 days. And he went into a meditative trance. And in that meditative trance, he says that he reached enlightenment. And then he began to teach others how to reach enlightenment. And so the understanding in Buddhism is that eventually you and I reach a place called nirvana, not the band, but a place or a state of existence, and that's when we stop being reincarnated and we reach enlightenment and we've overcome karmic debt. There is karmic debt in Buddhism as well as Hinduism, and that's part of the process. So here are the four truths, the noble truths that Buddhism teaches about suffering. First truth is life is characterized by suffering. Number two, suffering is caused by attachments. So it's what, cause, what they claim, is, what Buddhism claims is that our suffering is caused to the fact that we're attached to things, that we like things or that we love things or that we're attached to whether they be people or items or materialism, whatever it is. And so part of the purpose, as, as you see in number three, is to, that we're to overcome our attachments. And so detachment is the path of Buddhism. And so number four, the, eight, the fourth truth is the eightfold path is the way to overcome suffering, and it's the way to overcome those attachments in life, then that, that's the reason we suffer. And so in a sense, you know, in Buddhism, all this doesn't really exist. All this that we are actually, we're, we're just, this is all just kind of, uh, I, I don't know what the right word is, but we're all experiencing something that's not real. It's kind of like the, remember the matrix? Remember the, it's like that. We're in the matrix, and that was a Buddhist thought in that whole movie, throughout that whole movie series. So think about that. So here's the eightfold path. The eightfold path is this, right understanding, right thought, or right livelihood, right thought, right effort, right speech, right mindfulness, right action, and right concentration. That if you will practice those things, then you will, be, you will detach yourself from everything and become enlightened. And so that's the path of Buddhism, and it comes out of the context of Hinduism. So, and I'm not gonna go into all that and explain all that because one, I'm not an expert on those things. There's plenty out there that you can read about that. I just wanted to kind of give you it in a nutshell, kind of the basics, so you had a little bit of understanding. And as we shift and talk a little bit about our scripture today, well, when you think about suffering, those of you who have been to Sunday school or studied the Bible, when you think of the word suffering, who's the biblical character that comes to your mind that's, that you think that you associate with suffering? Job. Everybody got that one. Job is that. Now, Job was one who suffered, and he was suffering, and when he was suffering, he, he lost everything. He lost all his wealth. He lost his family. They all died. They were killed. He lost all his, his cattle. He lost everything, and then he became very ill and sick, and so his friends come to comfort him and talk to him, and so he's having this discussion in the book of Job. is really a discussion between him and his friends about suffering. And here's one of the things that Job says and he longs for as he's talking to one of his friends. He says this in Job chapter 9. He says, if only there was someone to mediate between us, that means between him and God, someone to bring us together. He wants to have a relationship with God where he can go to God and tell God, look how much I'm suffering. Look at what my needs. How, 
please help me, and he wants to be able to state his case before God, and so he wants to have this relationship with God in the midst of his suffering, and he's longing for it. But in the Old Testament, that didn't exist. God was far off. God was distant. God, you, you had to go through uh, priests and temples and sacrifices to get to God. And so he's longing for this, and so Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our high priest, and in a different way than any other priest, that, that Jesus is the high priest, the one who is the mediator that Job is longing for, that the longing of the Old Testament, Job and others, was they were longing for Jesus. And so Jesus enters the scene, and Jesus becomes the high priest, the one who can bring us together with God. And that's what Hebrews is telling us, that Christianity is about a person, not a path. It's about who we know and not about how we do these different things or follow these teachings or do these different things. I think sometimes, as I think about religion in general, all religions in general, I think sometimes we have a way of making religion like the MVA. Has anybody ever been to the MVA? I assume most everybody in this room has experienced the MVA, am I right? Okay. So I, you know, I'm getting ready to take another daughter to get a driver's license. So pray again for me. I've went through this once. This is hopefully the last time I'm going to do this. But you go to the MBA, and the first thing you do when you get in the MBA is you go to the information disk, and you get a what? Number, right? And then you, they say, go sit over here and wait for your number to come up on one of these screens over one of these desks. And so you wait, and you see the numbers popping up, and you're waiting, you're waiting. Then finally, your number pops up on the screen, so you go over that desk and you do some, some information, some paperwork, and then they tell you what? Go back, sit in the area, and wait for your number, right, to be called. And so then you wait again, and then they call your number over at another desk, and that's the desk where they talk about, you know, ask for your paperwork to get your, go take your driver's test, and so they sign, you know, you go there, you already have an appointment, but you get your person assigned, then they tell you after that paperwork's fit up, go sit in the waiting area and wait for your number, right, and so you guys have been there before, right? it's amazing, so you go there, and then they call your number, to go take the test and you take your child out there, your young person out there in the car and you're trembling and you get the, they take the test and you watch them and they, whatever happens, happens and you, they tell you to go back in the waiting area and wait for your number, right? And so your number to be called, then they call your number, you go up to the count, next counter, they take the, the, your daughter, son or daughter's picture, right? And then they tell you go wait in the area and then go wait till they call your number, right? And then you finally go up again when they call your number again, and you get your license. Whew. How many people like going to the NBA? <laughs> I think sometimes religion becomes that complicated that I have to go through this process or this God or this place or this hoop, and I've got to go here and then here and then here, and if I want this, I get this, and da-da-da-da. And I want to suggest to you what Hebrews is suggesting to you and I is that it's not about all, it's not about all these things. It's about knowing the high priest. And the high priest is the mediator, the door to God. And the thing about this high priest is that you and I if I go into, if I go into, a, if I come up to a house and I just walk in to the house and go on into the living room and, or go check what's in the fridge, I don't have to ring the doorbell, I don't have to knock on the door, what does that make me? Family, right. Jesus, the high priest, makes us family with God. We don't have to go through all these things and wait around for God. We can go directly into God's throne room, Hebrews says, with boldness, with confidence. Hey, Dad, this is what's going on in my life. Can you help me out? That's what it says, that if we have a need, we can go directly to the throne room of God. We can walk in with boldness because of Jesus, our high priest. We don't have to go through all these hoops. We don't have to jump through all these things. We don't have to go through all the sub-gods or the saints, or the Pope. We can go directly to God. 
Now, the other thing that's really cool about Jesus is that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus identifies with our sin condition. And what the Bible teaches is that sin causes suffering, not our attachments, but our sin and our desires are what cause suffering. And then he goes on in, chapter, in part of chapter 5 in verse 8 and 9. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, for all who follow him. And so I want you to think about this. Jesus is someone who not only understands our weaknesses and our sin, he's also someone who understands what it's like to suffer and go through suffering. He cried. He shed tears. He experienced pain, heartache. He experienced all those things that you and I experienced. And you know, I've been watching on the news uh, this week. What's been on the religious news this week? What's, the, what's been the big topic? Pope Francis, right? It's been on TV. I've never seen so much airtime for a religious figure, and which is good. I'm, I'm all for it. Something different. <laughs> for a change. But I think about how wonderful it's been. And I've been trying to think about, so why is this guy such a rock star? <laughs> you, know, what, you, know, you know, I like what he's saying, and I like, and I've started to think about it more, and I thought, what is it about Pope Francis that is so attractive to us? Right. Yeah, those are all things. There are lots of things. Here's the thing that I think about. He's not being the Pope. He's not elevating himself way up here and saying, I'm the Pope and you all have to listen to me. What he's doing is he's coming down to be one of us and he's saying, I need prayer just like you need prayer. And he's beginning to walk alongside of people. He's become more like us and more like Jesus, right? Jesus was a rock star when he was here. And what attracted people to Jesus was that he wasn't this rabbi that was coming around just saying, here's how things are going to be, and you guys got to listen to me. He came and he walked among us. He suffered with us. He understands our weaknesses. He became one of us. God became flesh, one of us, and became and experienced what you and I experience. And because of that, he was able to be the one to open the door to God. You and I have direct access to God as a brother and sister of Christ, as a fellow human being with Christ. You and I can walk on in. The question remains, though, that we wrestle with the same thing some people in Eastern religion wrestle with is they call it karmic debt, right? But we, you and I still, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, we wrestle with that too. We think, have I, got, have I done enough good to outweigh my bad? Am I, can I somehow overcome my guilt? Can I somehow overcome my sin? Can I, can I, will it ever balance out? Will it ever get better? Will I just come back as another animal or another human being? How will we ever know that our karmic debt has been paid? Well, I'm going to leave you with what Paranika had to say about what, how she she understood how her karmic debt was paid. So back in those days, you know, I was uh, doing the things that my parents would ask me to do and participate in the Hindu custom and culture and things. And um, there are a lot of uh, Catholic schools in India, so I went to one of them, good schools, and so uh, I did my schooling there and uh, participated in the Christian uh, Catholic prayers and uh, had no issues whatsoever to add, um, you know, Mary, Joseph, and uh, Jesus to the line of guards that I already had. And uh, you know, when ex- after all, when exam time comes around, or you know, if you have a um, stronger need, or, you know, then you, the more guards you pray to, the better it is. So that's how I was. And then um, I even remember uh, one of the things the to keep in perspective is that that part of the world, especially in India, they teach you that all religions are equal. This is textbook teaching. All religions are equal and they lead to one ultimate God. And um, so 
I even remember uh, having an argument with one of my Christian friends in school, high school. Um, you know, how can you say that your God is the only God? You know, after all, all religions are the same. Of course, that argument didn't go anywhere, but, you know, I, and then I went on to an uh, engineering college and I had a Christian friend um, who was uh, uh, following Christ faithfully and simply in her own way. So where are you going, you know, what is that important? And she said, I'm going to a uh, small group prayer meeting. I was like, okay, um, I want this please thing to be done with. So I was like, okay, um, let's make a deal, you know. I will, you stay with me and uh, we'll pay the uh, fees today and I'll come with you for the prayer tomorrow, you know. So she stuck with her part of the deal and <laughs> the next day I was like, okay, I have attended enough Christian prayers, so, you know, uh, what is one more, you know. So I went with her to this uh, small uh, prayer group there were a few girls and most of them were from Hindu background and they were praying and I was like, okay, you know, this is different from the Catholic prayer that I have been to. So I was just uh, watching them and then uh, the way they were praying was like uh, they were more closer to God and it was like, um, are, these, are they all in their right mind? You know, I had to open my eyes a couple of times to make sure that everybody is okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so, um, that was that day, and then, um, <clears throat> but something kept me going back, you know, like, uh, I kind of had the feeling that there's more to it than just this one day. So I was going, um, continuing to go as much as I could, and then uh, trying to learn about uh, Jesus and the faith. And uh, um, one of the days when uh, it was just me and my friend, uh, we were praying and at that time I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that I'm a sinner and I needed Jesus in my life and that God is the, Jesus is the solution for my karmic debt and that he can forgive sins and uh, I have the free grace and it is my choice to accept that grace. Um, even though it's free grace, it's not really cheap grace for God had to give up his only son and Jesus has had to lay down his life. And because of his death on the cross, and the suffering, and the resurrection, he, can, he could give me the eternal life, and that he can forgive sins. So at that time, I bowed down and gave my life to Jesus, and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Peace c comes from knowing that um, I'm in touch with the true, true God, mm -hmm. and that he is with me regardless of, you know, um, the good or bad things that I do, yeah. you know, um, obviously nobody is perfect, right? so, uh, and God is not going to let me go just because I did a bad thing. He, will, he is uh, passionate about me. He loves me enough to pick me up and just like a child walks and then falls down. The parent doesn't disown them. They just pick up the child, you know, uh, dust them off and, you know help them to learn walking, so.